I'm really excited about this format where we have the chat going in Slack. I think it'll be really great and a cool opportunity to sort of follow up on any open questions after afterwards. So please do drop your comments in as we're going and love to surface them here in this conversation. Julie, Boris, welcome to both of you. We, we have a great and exciting topic today, operational analytics. Maybe before we dig into things, if you two don't mind introducing yourselves for, for everyone watching. Julie, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I can start. So I'm Julie Bannon, head of analytics at Clearbit. My journey to get to this role really started in the marketing ops world. So was the person trying to get a lot of the data I needed to use without the skills and tools to be able to use it myself? And so I've since kind of moved into the role where I can build out and engineer, as they say, all of this data and be able to kind of bring it to life. Yeah, so based up in Toronto and really enjoying kind of this conversation. Boris and I had a DBT office hours a few months ago, and that was really, really entertaining. <laughs> cool. um, all right, Boris, how about you? Hey, uh, so I'm Boris Javess. I run uh, Census along with a group of much more talented people. We've been trying to figure out how to help companies be more, you know, data driven for a few years now. And we were always frustrated by the fact that different arms of the company had different uh, versions of reality. And that always felt very wrong to us. And then you're like, who has the best version of reality? And that seems to be Julie and whoever owns the data. And so how do we get that data to everybody else? It's kind of like how census was born. And, and then you kind of just get to watch what people do with it. And it's really great. Yeah, right on. We'll probably it's sort of really windy San Francisco. It's quite windy today. San Francisco. Cool. Okay. And I guess last time Drew Bannon, right? Claire entered me, VP product, co-founder here at Fishtown Analytics. I, we are currently in fact census users and I have built an integration with Clearbit in the past. And so this is certainly something that I found myself doing many times over this idea of operations based on data. And so I'm excited to dig into it with both of you. So to start us off, this is kind of like, I think. The most interesting starting point is we talk about operational analytics. How's that different from regular analytics? I, you know, good if this is like conversational, so I don't want to call on anyone, but if you want to just jump in, what do you think? I, I'd love to chat about it. So I, before I was able to operationalize the analytics, I felt that it was, you know, the way it was used was a window into all of this work we'd done in DBT. And so we'd made this kind of great source of truth. Uh, but all we could do is peer into it. And I think what that made me feel is and we were kind of the end stage. We were the team that reported on it. We were essentially overhead. We didn't come in and do the work. We reported on the work. And I think operational analytics takes all of that, you know, all of those models that you spend hours building and testing and admiring and being able to turn those <laughs> days, months, years, being able to turn that into something that gets you. So that insight that you get from your report of like this, this field, this segment, this data point, you know, increases conversion by X percent. You can take that data point now and you can put it into places where you can do something with it. And that's, that means that we're, you know, combining the two, that same source of truth is being used operationally and in the reporting, the reporting side. Yeah. I think it's in marketing -y terms, right? It's like, it feels like we've the difference, what operational analytics means is that you go from being kind of like informed about what's going on to actually driving the business rather than, you know, just kind of learning about what's going on at its worst, right? It's like, I guess data is almost like a finance team. It's like, let's pour through the books and see what happened, which is really not what any of us aspire to be doing. But oh, sorry, apologies to any accountant in the audience. Really, <laughs> I watched it that one. But I think that's the first like difference. And I think there's one other that's maybe more technical, Drew, that we can talk about, which is, I think it's also a different way of looking at data, which is, I think traditionally analytics was first and foremost focused on looking at full on aggregates, right? What is going on in the whole business and operational analytics to me is about zooming down to the cohort, to the individual, to the company, because that's what the end, you know, users in the company need to, to, to help make better. Right. So, you know, there's a version of operational analytics that happens where the operations happen after the data goes to someone's eyeballs and then they open up a new tab in a CRM or something like that. But really, yeah, we're working with, with data points that are just much more numerous than the, the types of data points that most people can sort of internalize and act upon. Right. And that's, it's like automating that 
exchange of information between kind of different tools. So that's a really interesting point. I'm curious, are there approaches or methodologies that might differ between when you're doing like regular analytics and operational analytics? Like what, what's different about how you approach it? I mean, Julie probably has an interesting take on this, but my, my biggest take is what I was saying, which is I think there's a difference like in, in the underlying technical work. If you are saying, hey, let's make a chart that shows, you know, here, what, what, here's a noun in census, right? So like how many things are syncing? There you go, like records synced, right? It's very easy for us to build a chart for our internal analytics dashboard that says, how much data is moving in census total? Very easy, not, not, not trivial, but easy. Much, much more difficult and different to build that on a per, like I said, per, per customer, per person, per, you know, per, what if the person's in multiple companies, right? All these things become much more difficult, but actually more important because no one, no one in the operation side of the house cares about the total. The total is basically meaningless except for the, you know, you and the CEO and over like looking at, you know, the whole business. And so that to me is, is like different in kind in terms of what you have to build underneath. Sure. Julie, what do you think? Yeah, I would say that a lot of it is, whereas we're rolling up on the analytics side, what, what I try and do is link. So, you know, here's John at Acme, he's done this, 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 and this, and we need to be able to see his whole journey. And there's a million different ways in which he's kind of identified who he is. And so it's, it's linking that whole journey together and grouping it by, you know, whether it's his company or whatnot, being able to turn him around or turn that person around in any way and see uh, where else that person has kind of been, what else that person is part of. And so that, you know, whether you're looking to action in an email marketing campaign, you can quickly pull the segments of all the people that have ever done X, Y, Z. So it's just, it's much more linking individuals through a whole bunch of different activities and attributes. Yeah, right on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and maybe, I mean, I think once you've mastered that, which I think takes time, then you can get into cohorts after that. Yeah. Sure. I think there's also probably a higher barrier of confidence required to use data operationally, because if your top level numbers are 99% right, that's pretty good for eyeballs. But if you're going to send emails or discounts or things like that off the data, like you kind of need that next step of confidence. Yeah. You uh, make uh, just we might have some <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, 80% accurate isn't good enough in operational analytics or sorry, it can be, but you're not going to sleep very well. Right. So you, you put yourself in that chain, in that line of fire, so to speak, of like, we're sending out 14,000 emails. And if you mess up a data point, it's not super accurate. That turns out to like, you know, 36,000 emails to people. And it just sort of, the impact is more noticeable and it's, it's more yeah. immediately felt when that happens. So yeah, the accuracy is, a, it, but to be fair, because it's all coming from the same source, it's this feedback loop between, you know, your analytics and your operations that just continues to improve that overall data set. So it's stressful, but it's a continual improvement that you're getting because it's being used more regularly. Yeah, there's no question, right, that the, 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 the stakes are higher. I do think there's also, people have been accustomed to receiving data a certain way on those, in those systems. Take marketing tools like that Julie deals with a lot. They're kind of used to, they've been accustomed to this idea of like, well, whenever something happens in the app, just, it just shows up in my, in my marketing tool and that way I can send an email. But you end up having this situation where like two different people are aggregating data and what is the credit card state if there's been three swipes? It's like, who knows? And, and, and so kind of transitioning to saying like, let's agree on a small set of attributes <laughs> and work off of those, I think has been the most interesting shift in order to get this right. So it's like, it's very hard to fix events, right? Like they're there, they're on the other side, it's too late. Like now you have to undo those, forget it. So I think the way I've seen uh, folks try to get into operational analytics a little bit at a time is to say, well, let's start with a small set of like attributes, state, like actual variables. And if they're not perfectly right, we can fix them. And that allows you to have a little bit of an iteration loop. And then once those are, are good, then you can start to expand into a broader set I don't, can't even imagine how many Julie must be dealing with now. <laughs> yeah, I would say that is exactly the approach we tried to take is like, what are the core attributes we need to function 
And then as they became, so it was more of a white list versus a blacklist approach when we first started using census with DBT. It's like, here are the, I think we went a little big. I think we went like 150 oh, yeah, maybe. Sure. <laughs> but but the approach was to still pare it down from the 100, you know, plus I mean, more. It, it helps, right, Drew? It helps if you're replacing something that's already broken, then you've got a lot more leeway. It's like, well, this yeah. is less broken. Well, yeah. yeah, I can absolutely tell you, we. We had a script we used to update our, our customer success tooling from the warehouse. I think I wrote it in Python on a weekend, you know, a couple of, like a year ago. And it, it was it didn't work for like a quarter. We just didn't realize it wasn't updating intercom. And so when you're starting with like, well, it's actually not functioning correctly. Right. Uh, it's like there's nowhere to go but up. Right. The yeah. actual the failure modes are very there's also they're they're much they're very different, right? So it's it's not like, okay, the chart is wrong, like you said. It's, is there data, did the data stop going there? Is it duplicated, right? It's Julie, I think, dealt with a lot of duplication. I think that, these are all like different problems that you, when it comes to the testing side of things, like these are new things to test rather than just, is there an outlier, let's say, yeah. and correcting for outliers. You know, one of the things that stands out to me is that if you're if you're doing operational things, you, you want to affect some change in, in the, the world or maybe the business as a result of, of whatever that operation might be. Yeah. So it makes me wonder, you know, does it, does it make us want to prioritize things like slowly changing dimensions more where we can sort of see the users in one state, they got the drip email and now they're in the next state and be able to measure the actual impact of that operation, whatever it might've been. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually a, a, something we're looking to measure right now. So because, we've been able to kind of track each stage. We can track their kind of progression through the stages and progression through like when they did it, how long it took. And so that's all DBT aggregated fields that we've just flagged and pushed on to the user and, and tracked their current state, regardless of whether, you know, if many of you probably use Salesforce, there is, there is tracking of stages, but as it goes through lead to opportunity and kind of earlier prospect stage, there isn't a consistent tracking across that. And so because we've been able to uh, bring all of these sources together, we've been able to track every stage. And that's something we're actually putting into our our marketing automation pretty soon is that they'll be able to run campaigns based on people, where they're, where they're sitting in the stage and see how many they can move from one stage to the next, which is pretty powerful and easy to report on once you have it all kind of like nicely laid out. Yeah. My recollection, right, when people start first started thinking in terms of we didn't even use, I think, the word customer journey back then. But like, think back to when Mixpanel first came out way back, right? And you'd be like, you can build a funnel. And it was this amazing visualization of like a customer journey, right? In a single app of a single kind. It was like website to sign up to you know convert. And now I think we all understand that that is essential. And the more, the, the thing that's changed is that your customer journey now is almost by definition. I don't know if you, you know anyone isn't like this, is multi-app and multi kind of it's, it's way more complex. I, I was talking to one company who was like, I, I drew a picture of like our customer journey. And it's like, so what puts them in this bucket? It's like, well, it's like, they've done this and this, well, maybe this, but like also if we've talked to them, it's like, wow, okay. So, but, but it's, he has a mental map, but he has no way, you know, to, 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 to reify that right into, into something. And you, I think that, that that's what, when Julie says you need a complete picture, I think that this is a new piece of, info, right, that you put on on a, on, a, on a person or a company or attribute, right, like that you add to these things that that's just new, that's a new kind of computed attribute. So, so I wonder about the, the different stakeholders that are involved in, in these operational activities and sort of what, what things you might need from them and what things they might need from you to sort of have operations go well when when it's sort of a new way of thinking about this it yeah. probably if i had to guess in a lot of cases it's going to take something away from that person that they care a lot about and for you know a, a greater good but how do you navigate that and, and maybe has it gone or, or what are these responsibilities for these stakeholders I, I can speak to kind of one singular experience and boris can probably talk to a more general, but so I think at first, when you introduce this kind of workflow, the DBT plus census into your marketing automation, 
there's a little bit of resistance, right? Because I, as you said, I'm taking away their ability to click a button and connect, you know, whether it's a segment to write in and get all the attributes, I've taken away a little power. And the, I definitely was met with that. And it's this sort of abstract idea of census. It's, it's kind of the plumbing where you don't really get to see that, that screen so much of, there's, there's a lot that goes on that is not, you're, they're able to visualize. And so I think the struggle of that with the stakeholders and right now we're working, I'm working with just one other, there's only one other person at Clearbit that probably has ever logged in to census and that's okay because that's, <laughs> that's fine. I gotta, well, that, I gotta get an insurance policy on you. <laughs> so it's because it, it is the plumbing, it's the underworking that does a lot of the, a lot of the kind of, it does the heavy lifting, but it's not the hero, right? So it, our marketing automation team, like we have someone that manages that. The way that we've become to work together is they now know anything's possible. So at first there was this resistance and then I proved out, you know, we can create any any field you want, any aggregated field you want. And all of a sudden there was this buy-in to that. And we worked together as like, I have this idea of doing this crazy campaign and we can pair on it and we can come up with what fields are gonna be best and however we wanna compute it and it can be done. So it's really a, dreaming things and then we work together to build them which has been you know there's definitely obviously bumps in every row but it's it's worked quite well and bought a lot of trust into the the, the pipeline that we have yeah i so there are, i think you're right there are a lot of new kinds of stakeholders right and interestingly you can affect a lot of different parts of the business julie's talking about marketing automation here but support teams can be improved using data sales teams can be improved using data customer success teams can be improved using data accounting teams can be improved so all of them can benefit right and then you're right if they're used to doing it a certain way themselves you have this potential tension right and what what i found first of all is you know internal company politics are always always something to to to, 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 to have to to navigate so the easiest is almost always to go where things are fully broken or don't exist mm. that's always a great place to start and like prove out internally, like, you know, I think I remember there was one company where they needed to prioritize their support tickets and you can't, you know, you can't do that from a report, right? You can't do that from a dashboard. And so they needed to sync, you know, kind of high value bits, high value attributes on the users into their support tool. And they, there was no solution. It wasn't like there was a thing to do that. The, the support tool, it didn't know, it didn't know anything. It was like, it didn't have Stripe in front, it didn't have anything. So. So there you're just bringing water to people who have nothing. And so that, that makes it easy to work with that stakeholder, right? And I think then you get the proof point and then you can start talking to the, hey, marketing team, I know you're used to doing things a certain way, but what about, what about this? I do think I have definitely found it's difficult. I don't know if it's been the same thing for you, Julie here, which is to go back to my point about events versus attributes. I think, especially in marketing teams, they're so used to events. So when you don't give them that, they feel like you've taken away something that it's not just that you've taken away like where the data is living. It's like they've reduced their power, like in terms of their ability to send certain kinds of emails, when in reality, you're improving the quality of the data and they can send more better emails, right? Than what they would have with events. And convincing of that is like, I still have to figure out the blog post for this. Cause it's, it's like, th this feels pretty fundamental. Uh, and, and, and it's like, if you're getting into a technical conversation, it's like, you're already lost in terms of what the relationship should be. And then finally, I don't know. I think people do it differently at different companies, but I've been amazed to your point, Drew, about your, your script. Like you'd be amazed how many companies I've seen that are like effect, like what you would call sophisticated, where these pipes are not monitored. The plumbing's not monitored, period. It's unbelievable how long these things might fail silently. Like I'm talking six plus months. And the, I think there's a, education process we can all do as we get better at this, like on the data teams about testing and operations generally, rather than just the data modeling, that we can educate our stakeholders of, you know, there's a monitoring system for this. You can be on the emails. Like we can, you might be the fault, by the way. You might've broken the thing, not me. Like this happens. Right. Uh, uh, like in fact, very often and teaching them that like, hey, we're all in this together. And like, this is help us all. So, but that's new to them, right? Like. Talk about APM for salespeople like is going to go right over their head, but, but it, it, I think it is useful to start teaching that. Yeah. It's just like such an area 
of the active interest and teaser alert. That's something I'll be talking about at Coalesce in my keynote. If you haven't registered, you should do that, you should do that soon. Yeah, this idea of um, understanding what's happening across your the entirety of your, your sort of data practice and knowing who's responsible and what actions should be taken or, or what actions precipitated the problem. So right. Like we could, two weeks from now, let's book it office hours. We'll get back on and talk about that for an hour. Sounds great. Right. So, okay, let's, I think this is fascinating. I bet we'll circle back to organizational questions like this as we keep going. But one of the things I'm curious about is it really feels like this is an emerging practice, operational analytics, and the underlying tools aren't super new at this point in that data warehouses, we saw Snowflake IPO, it's, it's like not so nascent, you know, as, as, a, as a practice anymore using tools like these. And I'm curious what actual changes have occurred recently kind of in the industry that have precipitated this sort of new class of product and thinking operational analytics tools. I can give you my like high level view. And then maybe Julie has an interesting insight on how like things have changed at a technical level. I mean, the technical answer obviously is just that by separating, you know, compute from storage on the warehouse side, you can, you can now do these things without bumping into other things like that. That's why we all understand that Snowflake and BigQuery are great, right? And I know Julie herself has dealt with lots of redshift pain for a long time. Right, right. Yeah. But I do think there's a much higher level kind of uh, drive, which I kind of alluded to earlier, which is if you think, and now like I'm going to, I think of this as like the more fundamental force, let's call it, uh, which has nothing to do with data warehouses or anything like that, which is, I think if there are two variables that are just continually going up for all of us, right? Which is the number of users that we serve, the number of customers that we serve at, you know, at the scale at which we serve our companies, whether our users, which is because we're global, because of the internet, because of, you know, software, like all these standard kind of reasons that doesn't seem to stop. Right. And then the way in which we think of customer relationships is shifting, right? In the olden days, it was like, you bought the car, you walk out, you're done. End of relationship. You bought a shoe, done. And now everyone understands that a relationship is over a very, very, very long period of time. In fact, let's even joke and let's take the Snowflake S1, right? Why was it so popular? It was really net dollar revenue retention is what people got real excited about, right? Which is just code for like the relationship grows over time. And so if that's the case, if you think of those two fundamental forces, that means you have to engage with users throughout their life in the product, in your, in your company. And how do they engage with your company? Through product, through mat, like all sorts of engagement tools, right? And therefore the customer journey has to be aggregated through lots of different data points. Therefore you need a centralized team, like a data team, and you need a tool like a data warehouse to bring it all together. And then all of that can then be surfaced back to teams to do their job correctly. So you can get a consistent picture. That, that to me is the, the fundamental reason why this is all happening. Okay. So there's, there's more context that's spread out across different places. Longer period of time and more tools, right? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Julie, what, what's your take? Yeah, I would say, so when I joined Claybrook two years ago, we had more data than I've ever seen. And so I think one of the, one of the problems that everyone wants to solve is they want to see it all together. And so it's, it's that need to be able to take a million different sources of data and bring it into one place where we can all see it. And then there's this expectation that we can do something with it. And so I, it just sort of came naturally as, so as you prove out that like you can join it all together and it becomes super powerful, then people want to start to use it. And it, it really, the, the conversation, I had never heard of census before. It was, well, you've done such a great job and Fishtown has built all these wonderful models. It's like, okay, well, let's, let's actually it's actually work so that you needed to be able to do all of that work in advance and have those tools set up. And then it was obvious that there was a lot of value in these tables beyond just reporting and beyond just um, saying, Hey, we did a good job this quarter. And so I don't know what the kind of overall, it's just, we're expecting more and more. And as, as we see good things, we want to push what we can do with them and it became available. So let's use it. I mean, I, Drew, I definitely think of it that way, like, which is, you know, five trans stitch, Snowflake, BigQuery, DBT have set the stage for like, now we have an ability to do this. Now we must be get better at that job, which is, you know, 
how to correlate the data, how to how to manage the the, the models, how to like deal with lineage and all these things that you know you think about all day. And and then as as we work on that, it's like, well, how do we make it more useful? And and I think it's natural that, like I said, your relation. The last thing you want is buy a shoe and then you get an email about buying the shoe again. It's like, right. what, why, why am I getting? Um, Who has to that? Yeah. So, you know, if I had to throw my guess out, sort of in addition to what yeah. you were saying, it's probably the emergence of, of the analytics engineer and the tooling for that persona who can sit really cross-functionally and like define those central things for the business. Whereas if it's, if the marketing team trying to solve marketing problems and the sales team trying to solve sales problems, they actually don't have yeah. someone very central sitting across the two of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, one of my questions is, is, is there a set of skills that are sort of missing from the analytics engineer tool belt that will be really important in this operational capacity? Is it, I, I think we have enough, my personal take, we have enough titles <laughs> that we can, we can do to, to strip some down, but do we think of it as sort of like a, a new specialization? Is it something we'd want to consider in hiring for analytics engineers? Or is it just the same thing, but the output is API requests instead of a chart? It's a good question. I don't know if I yet, I, I, if I feel strongly yet about like, should you hire someone who is this, 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 this position? But I do think if you go into data teams that are, you know, somewhat larger, I think they already see it in three buckets, right? There's these core, 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 almost pure engineering parts of the data team, whether that's doing low level AI ML things or, or, you know, very low level data management. Then there is the, let's call it analytics engineer who, who's building out these unified models and, and keeping the data clean and up, up and running. And then historically, and I, I don't think this is even new, there's been these, you know, forward deployed data people, right? Like finance team needs a data person, marketing team, let's go send them out over there to go work there and do some analysis because we can't trust them to do it. And I feel like that, that role, you, you want it to be available, but you want it to belong to the data team. And, and the last thing I want is for every division to have its own, their own data analyst. It feels like that's bad from a managerial perspective and it, it would plausibly, like it would, it would cause push towards having many systems of record, which is the thing we don't want, right? Uh, so, so hope maybe that's the way to think about it. It's like you, you have data science team, uh, like people who are whose job it is to help support marketing, et cetera, but they do that from within the, the data organization uh, without having to leave and, and go work in Marketo. Great. What do you think, Julie? To your job title? Uh, so. I've thought a lot about this. I've been asked this question a lot is who's kind of the next, you know, especially when you're talking about taking it kind of the stitch, but reverse taking it out the census of who, who else is there? Should analytics be stopping at they've built the models and then someone takes it off or does analytics have to carry it all the way through? I, again, our, we're a data team of myself and kind of two other half resources. And we have someone who's kind of marketing op automation, marketing ops, but not really. So, my experience is going to be on the smaller scale, but I definitely see the work that I do for operational analytics as this very separate part of my brain and a very separate part of my workflow. And it does need to have understanding of kind of the business impact and understanding why we're building these models in a different way of, than analyzing data and looking at past results. It, it's got to have a bit more of a forward thinking approach to it. So do I think that like an operational analytics engineer will be hired at a company? Absolutely, because there are points of time where like, you know, a day a week of my time is going towards fixing, maintaining, you know, creating new models that our team can use to be smarter, more efficient. And I assume in bigger companies that that would be, you know, 10x the amount of work that I have to do. But I don't, I still haven't figured out where analytics ends and, you know, the sales ops, marketing ops support, like where that begins. I ha I don't have yeah. a great sense of that. Point. And, 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 and actually I'll, I'll add to that. And like, obviously it's something we have to think about all the time, right? Cause, cause whatever we, wh wherever that line is, we're going to be the interface. So, so it feels like that's something we, we should, we should have a strong answer towards, but I will say this, the skill Venn diagram is intersecting. So 
I, I meet more and more sales ops, biz ops, rev, whatever you want to call that ops side of the house, marketing ops, support ops, CS ops. They all have, you know, uh, they, they're all trending towards understanding that this is the better stack. And so I think there is a universe where they actually all become sufficiently savvy to integrate at, at some, you know, let's call it analytics, you know, kind of threshold of like, you still talk SQL, but you know, you're not in charge of the unified models, but you can build interesting filters, you know, takes on it, the customer journeys, like maybe the support person wants a different kind of tagging of like what state they're in, all that kind of stuff. And at the very least, I find that the skills are, are, are coming close. The Venn diagram is definitely coming like intersecting, which is good because otherwise you have to serve them something kind of that's too easy to use and it's not the right abstraction. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that's what made my transition to like analytics engineer kind of smooth because of the background in marketing ops. And, you know, it seems like it's admin, but your job is really data driven. Like you are responsible for making sure that the sales marketing support teams have the data they need and it's accurate to like, you know, I saw somewhere in the comments, 99.99, your job is to get it as close to hundred percent as possible. And so you have that mindset already of working through and, and, and managing data and, and making sure that it's modeled in a way that's going to be usable. And so I think the hard skills from our marketing ops sales ops person is that SQL knowledge, which I have been seeing more. And even on our team, like picking up the skills to be able to do it themselves. It's just a natural kind of progression of, of their role. Yeah, I can imagine it being really challenging for someone in a traditional marketing ops background to come in and build a new DBT project and architect it well and uh, start from scratch. But if you're tapping into an existing corpus of models and sort of have good yeah. documentation, yeah. Best yeah. Yeah. like, I mean, I think you do. The, I mean, you 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 do more to, to to evangelize this than we do. But I do think of it very much in a in a layer cake, right? Of like, there are parts of the DBT project that you should not look at unless you are the person who knows how to deal with it. And <laughs> you can make layers that are a lot friendlier for for people to 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 plan. And here's the thing, and it it's nice because it feels like sometimes you're bringing you know again like it, you're giving people something that seems hard but is actually so much better than what they're dealing with which is I've seen sales ops people who, who you exactly like sit on the counterpart of like you think of like Julie and then the more, the more, you know, action business oriented person. And they've managed to, once they realize that they have the, the warehouse is theirs to, to use and, and SQL is theirs to use, and it can seamlessly go to Salesforce or whatever, they start moving logic out of really terrible languages like Apex and into SQL and they're happy, right? At first, they think this is freaky, but then they're like, wait, this is actually just playing better, period. Yeah. And so that to me is like, it's already better. It's already better without even all the things that make it super nice with DBT. Do you know what I mean? Like that's, so clearly here, there's, we just gotta, we gotta show them that this is possible. Yeah, if you can write Apex, uh, you've got the technical chops required to be a SQL master, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Julie, there's a question from the chat for you. Do you find that you use that sort of a different sub DAG of models kind of specifically to power operational things, or is it all just like kind of dimensional modeling that, that powers the powers your operations? Yeah, that's a good question. So I originally created and still have a separate model for our like operation versus analytics. They're essentially the same thing. I've just what I did was add a whole lot more attributes on the operational models that were completely useless, so to speak, because on the analytics side, I've been debating whether to just merge them all together and use the census query editor to add in kind of new attributes. And the reason I say that is, you know, use that DBT model for analytics and operations that's the same, that's the same core base of attributes that everyone can can work off of and then when it comes to these kind of aggregated models put them in put them in census because then the marketing ops team can go in they can manage it they can see it they can edit they don't have to they don't have to set up dbt which is a very intimidating process they just have to go to this one blank sheet and and update a line of code change a name it's a little bit more uh, user friendly from someone without a ton of SQL experience. So that's the approach I've been playing with right now. 
it's been working. So I've been moving a lot of the models to a place where they're visible to anyone to change them. So they're not locked in my head, yeah. in my world. It's been working and they're quick. It's quicker to turn it around and update and test. The only problem is that we don't have the functionality of the DBT, you know, models building and testing and making sure. So there is a higher chance of errors. It's a trade-off I have yet to figure out where yeah. to sit. Yeah, I mean, we have a product to build for that to make it more seamlessly, uh, like plug directly into the DBT stack. But uh, that's a, yeah, I do think that's a really good question. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think I have a better answer than what than what Julie said. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah. defining an interface is just hard. Yeah. At a human level, at a code level, it's it's don't. I think that maybe my main thing is to say don't think of it as done. Think of it as something you're you're iterating on, and and sure. yeah. lots of tech companies really would be surprised at how complicated it is to get an interface right and. Sure. Yeah. There, you know, there's always going to be sort of the last mile. It's, you know, totally look, look ML is great for transforming a date time every way you might want to slice it or things like that, or do you want Booleans or integers and fine. I think that's okay. Okay. If a lot of that isn't defined in the core modeling logic itself. Um, Actually, Drew, you yeah. say this, but like, Julie, how often has a marketing team said, I want a weekly number and uses the wrong week aggregation or any kind of time aggregation how often have they gotten a time aggregation different than you have pre a couple months ago or maybe six months ago often enough but we've used dbt to lock in the months right. and the weeks and the dates and we have this like metrics model that if you're not using it then i don't want it you know i don't want to hear <laughs> what your right. thoughts are on the numbers because you're not using the right model <laughs> this is my favorite thing right like you want to zoom in on like forget events like Time, time. No one even agrees on time. So there's, there's I've said, I've met so many people who are just talking to the day. They'll, they'll, they'll call Julie, so to speak. And they'll be like, I want, like, I just want what they've done last week. And they're like, that's, that's not enough information. Like that is not a spec for the yeah. metric. What right. week? Last seven? By what definition? <laughs> It's hard, it's hard. It's hard to get everyone sort of aligned. You zoom all the way down, like it's yeah. those things, right? It's not even these higher level like customer journey questions. It's yeah. like the definition of seven. <laughs> yeah. All right. Time. Um, that's not, that's not, <laughs> so, sorry. Yeah. Speaking of time, we're we're coming up. So let's. Here's what I'm gonna do. There's a couple good questions I think I'd like to run by you, and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe we'll we'll cut a little bit into the demo time and and have like ten ish minutes. Okay. Julie, question for you. What's the most exciting development you're perceiving in this product space today, in this, in this problem space today? So I think I've chatted about this a little bit. It's becoming a value add, like being able to contribute to the actual dollars and being a part of that team, starting earlier than just reporting on the end. We're just seeing so much more flexibility with like how we can use data and how we can get creative and you know, one of the things we're going to do is start using it as part of our advertising. So all these DBT models that we've done, all this great segmentation, all this at, like attributes on, pushing that through to, you know, one of our products and being able to run campaigns based on these really well-defined groups. Yeah. I, That's cool. Come in a moneymaker. <laughs> okay, right on. Coming a moneymaker. <laughs> I can't wait for the Gordon Gecko movie. Of, uh, <laughs> but that's pretty epic. And I, I usually get the references. You, you miss me on it. I apologize. Wall Street from the eighties. The my, uh, sorry, yeah. sorry. It's too, too old of a reference now. Well, yeah. we'll do Wall Street. What I should go with? That's the modern. No, I, I saw that one. Yeah, that's good. Um, that's, the right, that's the right modern one. Okay. So then, okay, that's good. What problems, Julie? Do you feel like we're either you know on the cusp of solving, or or we haven't quite solved yet along this axis? Ooh. What keeps you uh, up besides the the eighty percent good data? Oh, that's a good question. So I think that data literacy is still one of the problems that we're trying to solve internally. Like, what does this mean? And just the ability to create a whole lot of new attributes on the fly. We're a very technical team at Clearbit, which is wonderful. But that also means there's whole whole bunch of new things coming in and what to use and what not to use. And I think regardless of how great your pipeline is if people don't understand what that data point means, it doesn't matter how nicely you put it into their tool. <laughs> so that's one problem I still have yet to solve to the point where we just speak the same language of every data point and how it's calculated, how it's collected. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, that'll, I think, as long as innovation is happening, that will continue to be a problem, like <laughs> yeah. education and, and, and language and um, how we communicate. Okay, and then, so Boris, a question for you. Close your eyes and cast your mind forward five years. <laughs> what, what does this space look like? What's your, what, what do you dream about when you think about operation? My dream is, is, is really simple, right? It's, yeah. it's, if we can get credibly at a company to say, we have a system of record, that the whole company agrees on, that would be mind-bogglingly good. That's it. Like the world we live in today is some people will tell you Salesforce is that, and we all laugh. And to me, like the warehouse is the right technology to store it all. And then we just have to make it so that the whole business can leverage that. And so to me, you know, Drew, you, you, you and I could probably riff all day about Spark and speed and latency and warehouses, like that needs to keep getting better so that we can have one, like one version for the whole freaking company. That's the dream. That's it. That's simple as that. I would, I would add on to that. And I think it's something I've learned over time is I was very, I was very much tool. Like you need to look at the data in this tool. And I think having the system of record be your kind of warehouse, but not really shouting to the rooftop that that's the case. It's just like put that right data in the right place and just, have the system of record update multiple places and everyone just assumes their record is the best, but it's all the same. I think that that's led to less resistance of like, I've put the, the right data in your tool for you to use. You think it's Salesforce data, I don't care. Um, like, it's just- yeah, Drew, I, I, I think all SaaS apps are just a, a cache on your data warehouse. That's funny, yeah, okay. Did you, did, you, did you have more to say about that or is that- No. Okay, good. Okay, this is my last question before we jump into the demo, and I left it for last because it, it might be contentious. I agree, data warehouses are wonderful pieces of technology in a batch-based capacity. Is streaming a prerequisite for effective operational analytics? Yes or no? Julie, I'll let you take first dibs. No, I don't have an answer on this one. <laughs> Here's what I'll say. I think the latency matters to everyone the speed at which business operates and especially tech matters what i found is you can probably get a lot of value for correct within minutes like truly correct consistent within minutes versus hard to determine if correct within seconds do you know what i mean yeah. uh, so that's kind of where i land on this like Apart for things like a password reset email or, you know, these kinds of things where like, okay, like every second will piss off the user, literally, you know, let's say you wanted to get an invoice out to a customer, like, and that had to wait a few minutes for this all to kind of compute and determine what the number should be off the accounting system and the bill, you know, all that, that's fine. So well, let me, let me prompt you in this sort of, you know, modern data stack with decoupled data loading and then modeling and then things on top of it. Even even minutes, you know, like single digit minutes right. is pretty challenging. So if we're For talking sure. half an right. hour, You're that's right. doable, but still you've got a warehouse running pretty much 24 seven and constantly loading your right. data and, and your, your DPT models, you know, in a batch based capacity are maybe constantly running. Is 30, what do we, I, the way I think about it, it's like 30 minutes is sort of the bridge between batch and real time. And if it's yeah. longer than 30 or yeah. real time, you're probably right. I think, look, maybe the, the, I agree that ultimately we have to find a way to bridge this. Like, yeah. Whether that's with a, you know, kind of the materialized kind of approach or something. Yeah. Uh, I think we do have to bridge this at some point. Yes. Uh, um, I'm, I'm glad you, you said materialize. I think when I close my eye, my, when I close my eyes and I look five years in the future, I see technology like what materialize is building that is in stream transformation and sort of data just constantly flowing through it both both as the inputs but what's really cool about you know technology like materialize is yeah the outputs you can stream data out yeah yeah i think yeah. i think you and i probably see eye to eye on that and ultimately you know i go back to the view of like what we want is one source of truth it's it's like a schema the key is the schema of truth or whatever <laughs> that's really what you want right and and 
hopefully then like, look, we, we can't teach all of distributed systems to the whole business. Yeah. So, so it's like, you have to eventually be able to say, okay, well, these metrics you'll be able to have within this amount of time and these metrics within this amount of time. And, and we have to find a way through our tools and our products to like deliver that in a way that is understandable to the, to the person on the edge who's yeah. in their tool. But yeah, I think, I think that's the right architecture probably. I, and I would just jump in. Like we, we had this problem Boris probably remembers of just like, we need certain things in real time to be able to do that basic segmentation. And then we can, the rest can come in and four hours later and we, we don't care. So it really is, it's really understanding and communicating that to the end user of like, these are the data points that we can get you right away. These are the ones that come in later, but we're, we're giving you much more accuracy on that. And then having that conversation of like, what, what can come in fast and maybe less accurate and what needs to be accurate to as much as we can get. And we've been kind of playing with that. We've been pulling fields over and data points over left, you know, some, some when they were wrong were really wrong. So we pulled them back into the every four hours and some needed to be accurate. So it's like both are great. <laughs> Obviously you'd like the batch to be faster because then you don't have to have that conversation of wait four hours because Redshift is going to break if we try and make it go any faster. But there, there is that understanding of that trade-off with the end user. I, I mean, Drew, this is a, I feel like this is almost its own talk that we could have, right? About like, I think about, you know, like, should, should attributes on a table have a latency associated with them, right? Not necessarily an exact one, but an order of magnitude so that you could transition that all the way. You, you think of lineage in terms of like what causes the data to become what it is, but there's almost this aspect of like, what is the effective bucket of latency that this, this thing is in? and Maybe that's, if we could transmit that all the way across, right? If census could, I mean, that's a kind of piece of information that we could add on top of the thing and, and might help the end user understand like, ah, you're looking at four hours ago data, broadly speaking. We don't even have to be precise. I think orders of magnitude would actually be enough for, yeah. for, for humans. I, I, it's a really interesting problem. Yeah, I really agree. It'll be exciting to see how it develops. The other quick teaser I want to throw out is we released uh, a new node type in dbt called an exposure and i think there's a lot of opportunity for us which we will discuss at coalesce you should sign up if you haven't already to leverage that lineage from data sources and sort of their latency all the way down to yeah. exposure which could very well be something like census running it's how we yeah. how we've set it up here at fishtown yeah, yeah yeah no i mean we we will you and i need to sync up <laughs> yeah, there you go. So maybe we got we got six odd minutes left. Boris, would you like to sort of share your screen and show that's us? A, that's a, that is a tight, tight timeline. I'll do uh I'll do the world's tightest, tightest demo. Okay. So let's see. So here I've got I've got census connected to a DBT project in which I'm only point there are lots of models in this project, but I'm only pulling the three that are in what we call like what I put in the publish folder. So you can think of census as connecting to a repository and then you can kind of put in a model selector because Drew, we did this before you invented exposure. So, you know, we'll talk, but basically you can say, well, what, what models should be visible to the business team? And then these are the three, right? And you can think of this as like, here's my unified cohorted, like per team unified kind of pieces of information. And I even made a kind of sales qualified query, which is, Hey, the world's dumbest one, but it's where VIP is true, right? And, and I can show you the, you know, the models, but basically VIP right now is its own model in the DAG that is like, has more than 10 users, something like that. And you can think of that as the kind of logic that you'd want at the last mile, because it's not about necessarily sending all the companies over into Salesforce or into your CRM or into, you know, your support tool. It's which ones are we interested in? So here I'm like, Hey, this is the teams that are qualified for sales and we can change this anytime, but I want to sync this to Salesforce. So I'm going to click add sync and I'm going to push Salesforce and we're going to turn Salesforce into a cache of all of these accounts. So I'm going to say, I want to, you could do a couple different things here in census. Like you could say, Hey, I only want to enrich metrics on things in the destination. But in this case, I actually want to generate, right? I, I want to generate new work for salespeople. So I'm going to create new accounts in Salesforce that people have to then go talk to. And then you can map that by an ID, right? So I'll use the company ID here. 
And so this will help you understand like what is possible in the destination systems because every SaaS product is different. And then you're like, well, how, how do I get data into Salesforce? Well, you got to give it a name. You got to give it a domain. These are rules made by the business team and every product is different and every team can set these up differently. So we're just here to make sure, you know, things don't break. And then when you hit next, I hit sync. This will do a full sync of the data and we're going to get, I think, I don't know, something like 50 or 70 new leads in our Salesforce, right? So what's going on here for those that have never seen census, which is probably most of you, all of this runs inside my data warehouse, right? So this is connected to Redshift in this example, but it would work the same in, in Snowflake or BigQuery. And there's a census schema that compares what we've synced before so that we make sure we only incrementally hit, you know, our, our, our tools like Salesforce and customer IO and Marketo, et cetera. Cause trust me, their API quotas are uh, problematic. So you want to limit that as much as possible. And we do all the type conversions and all the ways in which, you know, you, you have to make sure the metadata matches between the left side and the right side. And then all those metrics are going to land natively into Salesforce and people will have work to do. And then everything that went wrong will get saved again, back in the warehouse. So the next time around you can, you can fix it up and I can put this on a schedule. Speaking of schedules, you know, let's put it right at that cusp, How about right, right at that cusp of every 15 minutes Drew. Somewhere between batch and stream. It's streaming. It's streaming. It's streaming. It's streaming every 15 minutes now. I mean, the way census works, right? It'll do a quick check if anything changed. And then here, if you look at the history, right, you can always go and debug this. So one of the things that's key here is like, you'd be surprised how many people try to push invalid data into a tool. So we have a quick check here for like, this is not going to be approved, you know, by whatever it is you're sending it to. And so it's kind of like, you can think of it as like embedding the the Salesforce or whatever destination logic right here. So you, you, you can kind of understand why data is not ending up there. This is back to the silently failing pipelines, you know? And then if I open up Salesforce, so this is, uh, let's do this. I only have one tab, like one tab open. So let's see how this goes. So now I've created a bunch of work for the sales team. Let's go with new this week. Come on, come on, come on. Every time you demo, it's really the longest you have to wait for is Salesforce. There we go. So here are a bunch of new accounts we just created, right? And that just has the name of the account in the domain, but you can go right back into census, right? And we're right at the edge here. So I don't want to go over, but we can go back into that sync like a week later, a month later, a year later, oh, where'd it go? Right. I can go back into the sync and I can go edit it, right? You can have the business team say, Hey, I want more data. I want like how often this is an image editor. And it's like, I want how often they did added images and removed images, right? And then you just set those up and it'll just resync the data and that's it. And that just works. And now you have that data on the, on, on the end. And, and that way a salesperson has it at their fingertips when they call and they're like, I see you, you've been using this image editor a lot. Like mm -hmm. we should have you buy the product or maybe yeah. it's a customer success. Like, Hey, please don't leave. I saw you stopped using image editing. Funny. Well, thanks so much for the demo, Boris. And you know, to me, that really screams out the importance of awareness of the of the data itself. Poking in there, but yeah, we use census. We we really enjoy it. I, I in particular, I like that it works, whereas the thing we were using before did not work. Yeah. Um, so you really get that baseline of it works. That's that's. Um, I'll go back to the team and, and definitely tell them that. It's, that's a great quality. Sure. Um, so nice nice work, Julie, Boris. Thank you both so much for joining today on the Soft Hours.